uh, talking more about the the same. The conversations have already started. So we would like to invite Mr. Rajendra Pawar and Mr. Vijay Kalani uh, to talk more about it. Okay, so I am going to make a slight addition to this, though we have less time. I'll ask Anand Sudarshan, he is not with us tomorrow, he's leaving. So I just told you if he can reflect on the session so far and what he took away or what he still thinks are important or not touched, what he'd like to touch on as the first thing. Then we we'll spend a little time on NIT because in the present we are touching on it. And again, we don't want a long story. So, very short story and then few questions. Thank you. Um, I did mention that my background is uh, running Manipal Global Education, but to expand that and cover my background in four. I was in the tech sector as an entrepreneur. I started a, a few companies uh, very often, and then the moved uh, into the media. Education side, running Manipal Global Education. Microland, Microland. Anyway, so move from there. Then uh, since 2013, of course, I've been on the board of uh, NIT, but uh, 2012 onwards, uh, 13 onwards actually. I've also been an, an angel investor, very really early stage in angel investor incubator in the ed tech sector. Portfolio of uh, ranking companies, uh, three of whom, three of whom which have exited. Uh, very, very good entrepreneurs, all of them. Both seven of them have failed, uh, either shut down or uh, not fully discovered that they are in uh, life support. But they will soon. And uh, others are, uh, of the others, uh, six of them are actually doing well, which is a very good ratio. Six out of 19 for early stage is actually a pretty decent ratio. We haven't had any big exits yet. Why I tell you all of this is because I have gone through. And I understand by engaging with bread, bread entrepreneurs such as yourselves, many of the questions uh, that we are all asking is mostly probably not yet shared, maybe shared among yourselves and they get to experience. You know, there's a whole uh, corpus of it. What I thought uh, Raji asked me to do is to quickly reflect on uh, uh, the sessions and uh, today's particularly I have made some extra notes, I will spend a little more detail. I will take about uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes or so, uh, I'll try and finish in 10 minutes and then I'll open it up in uh, questions or to ask something. Therefore, this will be kind of a uh, speed kind of a update. Very quickly, um, yesterday's was uh, master class on digital marketing. I thought it was a very, very good. And Varun and Apoor, I, I thought they did an absolute bang up job. Uh, excellent. They are obviously extremely experience about this. Uh, you have to do a context translation, however, I did mention it yesterday. Uh, many of these things as applicable to event-based, uh, you know, transaction-based, uh, you know, platforms like Zomato and others uh, are not applicable for education. So you need to do a context translation, which I'm sure all of you are so bright, you, you must have already done it and we'll be doing this online. But I thought it was a wonderful session. Uh, the second session is uh, leveraging generative AI for edtech. Probably the one that had uh, maximum amount of early interest because of the excitement uh, generated by generative AI. Uh, Sri Kantan obviously did a good job, uh, pegged uh, Microsoft and his product beautifully, which of course they are all trained to it comes to the part of the year. Uh, and, uh, but he did answer questions and he was. What I liked about him, and this is the new Microsoft, I guess. What I liked about him is that where he did not know, he said, I don't know. <laughs> where he did it, but there's a couple of difficult questions that came up from all of you. He said, yeah, tough question, I have no clue. Now that requires a uh, very high level of confidence-based uh, humility. You know, if, if there's a phrase like that. So he displayed that ability. I actually loved it. Because there aren't answers to many of the stuff in AI. I, for one, happen to think that EdTech is an area where uh, um, generative AI is going to be, there is going to be people who will plan it, which has already happened in some countries and some universities and colleges and others. There will be some who will embrace this, which has also happened. Some of the <coughs> Ivy League universities at the master's level have already embraced, said that you can use as much as you want, which is another very interesting uh, you know, way of looking at it. And most people are in the middle. Uh, what that means is they are not 
to feel able to discuss it. They are yet to discover their pathway. And I, I for one, as a student of this sector, will be watching, observing universities, uh, watch their, what direction they take, and it's going to be a fascinating uh, next few years of <coughs> learning for me in terms of where this generated. But one thing I can tell you, uh, uh, as an instinct that I feel is that uh, please examine this very, very seriously for each of your businesses. It doesn't matter which business you are in, in the index line, which business you are in. Please examine it very seriously. I think it might make, make meaning for you in ways that you may not be prepared today. Uh, and as uh, domain uh, language models develop and uh, those domain language models become uh, subdomain, sub subdomain, and become sharper and sharper, narrow language models become sharper and sharper, uh, the extent of impact of generative AI is going to be, and we have seen only GPT-3 really, it's chat GPT, chat GPT plus, which is based on GPT-4, is an entirely different piece from what I hear. Uh, so that's going to be very interesting, so that was a good session. Mm -hmm. Very quickly on uh, today's session, I'm, I'm just going, then specifically I'm going to talk about a lot more about one session on uh, phone the questions, I will spend a little more time about that. From on that session, and we talked about uh, biology. Se biology session, you know, the periodic table that we put up. You know, and <laughs> think that was related to that. I thought, hey, listen, I know him. We have interacted with him a lot. Absolutely brilliant guy. Uh, and uh, Sapnesh's offer, I think, was very serious and very real. Uh, you know, you must for those of you where you think it's important, that it's useful, please reach out to him. You will not find. Uh, uh, any way uh, less than uh, exceptional that engagement. Um, this session I'm going to spend uh, some time about the next one, which is sharpening your pitch, which kind of morphed into a, a, a sorry, graphics and the uh, and uh, TV session, which both morphed into something else. I'm going to have a bunch of comments that I'm going to make, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, that last session, uh, which was on uh, product market fit. So we did a very, very tough session, I think he did a good job. Uh, the only uh, uh, one point I wanted to leave on that uh, product market fit part of it, I think uh, that's an evolving thing for, uh, so we did mention it as a part of saying, is it, it's Heisenberg, you know. So the moment you observe, the state changes, right? So that's, product market fit is like that. You have a theory with which you go, you go and put it in the market and it changes, you know. So it's Heisenberg all over again. So you have to be, uh, you have to be cognizant of it. So there is an, uh, there is a fundamental iterativeness that will be there before you, uh, you know, reach a point where you will be comfortable. And of course, at that point in time, everything will change the market because there will be new technology that will come, something else that will happen. So everything changes. And then when you bring in the dimensions of experience, student uh, for experience, we talked about that. Uh, bring in the role of the teacher, which is uh, often uh, underexpressed, understated, because the teacher has a massive influence uh, on the students and the shaping of the students' mind and thinking for life. Then it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a complex, uh, you know, again, it's going to mention that it's a very complex scenario. Let me just get back to the uh, few points. I noted several, I just wanted to take uh, uh, a few points. Um, how do fund founders protect themselves? I found about seven or eight questions that was around that particular open question. You know, I, uh, it's a valid question. I think the founders get worried about how am I going to protect all the big bad rules of uh, VCs and others come, what's going to happen to me. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair concern. Uh, but it's a concern that uh, um, is covered by, that's why you have a banker, um, that's why you have uh, good lawyers, I think, uh, he mentioned it, I think, you, you must have a good lawyer, it's, it's good uh, defensive mechanisms, you get people's facts, right, so that you don't get that. But that's all they do. You still have to catch the ball as a good keeper, so which means you still have homework to do, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's a process that you learn over the period of time. Um, jo Joel, right? Uh, there you are. So, somebody talked about trust when you were asking the question. One of the maxims I learned very early in my life is this, and this is taught to me by uh, a CFO of the Chavala Company. This is the principle in that you should work on is that trust, but very high. So, everything that you do, 
Don't start off with lack of trust because that's a negative thing that's kill you. But don't stop with trust. Get into details. So trust, but very really, And the gap is very uh, important gap. So first you should trust. Stop, embrace it. But don't stop there. Very hard. So I think that's the one thing I don't I don't want to interrupt that time when the flow is going on. But I wanted to share that with you. Um, other than that, you know, how do founders protect themselves? I think you protect yourself through three things really speaking, leaving the contract out. Okay? You protect yourself through performance. You do well as a protection. Honestly, you know, it really doesn't require it. You protect yourself through uh, through understanding where the how the world is changing and what you need to do to change the organization. Because then you uh, and you can do a lot of people who founder in those companies. You would be the you know, folks who will understand what needs to be done. Uh, to change. Third, uh, protect yourself by having a core foundation of values that you live with. An investor should see it. Transparency, honesty, sharing of information on a periodic basis, predictable, which means they know 6th of the month, update will come, 6th of the month, update should come. And that predictability <coughs> makes, you, um, um, makes you trustworthy from their perspective. As much as you trust, they also have to learn to trust. And people who you know, give money out take a little longer time to trust. Uh, so you must make sure that uh, you follow that your core of honor, which you share with them. And I think these three are the kavach that uh, you have to build for yourself. There are many other things. I don't want to realize it by any way. But I think these three are in your control entirely. Like execution is in your control for most extent. Sometimes. Things can still go back. So the most part is in your control. Looking at what direction the world is changing its strategies into it entirely new. And then the third one is again 100 percent That's something that uh, I thought I would share with you. In my own experience, going through what I have done from an edtech perspective, I've realized that uh, you know there's that phrase, best life plans of men and minds. You know, things we plan, you know, but that and you have to learn how to, um, you know, it's like uh, surfing, if you ever surf, you have to, your body has to be agile, you have to move the flow. And uh, that's a lesson only life must have already taught all of you, you just need to sharp it. Another question that came up is, uh, uh, what is the scale that is typically attractive for VCs and somebody asked, uh, scaling versus profitability. I think there, this is not an either or. I think don't get caught in what I call as the tyranny of the or. There is no or. There is no or between scale and profitability. Between the scale and profitability. And I think, and I would rather say profitability and scale. That's the way I would put it. And uh, in my life, I have learned that EBITDA is a, is for me, is one paragraph. Hammer myself, and I guess that I hammer everybody else that I come into contact with. Focusing on that will also help the company become you know, very powerful. It's important for me to keep that fact. So both are important. I don't think there is that VCs, um, you know, who understand this, and especially for your business. Again, I'm saying whatever I'm saying it is highly contextualized for the entire business. I want you to keep that. Uh, VCs who recognize that you have to be both profitable and you have to scale um, are the ones that you will have to end up dealing with and you know, you're using with this part. That's what I would say in your own search, uh, search less for people who give high valuations, not only for the reasons that were recited, but generally also. Search for people that will be with you on in the long run, understand your business and understand the changes that will be made. I think that's more important. Um, there were questions in terms of how do VCs evaluate the size of opportunity and so on and so forth. And Chinmay, uh, I think, asked the question about uh, VCs asked between is your business too ops heavy, uh, too low tech. I tell you what, edtech is ops heavy. You know, make no education, whatever you do in education is ops heavy. Whatever you do in education is high touch. Right? So, 
again therefore if you are going to go to a VC, you are going to say can you make it low tax, can you outsource this, outsource this. When you outsource, only the task is being done by somebody who is still accountable for it. So it is to me, it's still outsourcing. That doesn't change. So, you deal with the VC who understands these, I think it's good for you. Right? And of course, if you give extraordinary returns and you're flying high and the performance is high, all these things will be equal. At the end of the day, they need returns and they are your friends anyway. So, uh, so long as the returns are coming in. And if returns are not there, you're in trouble. That's, it's a such way, it's permanent. That's, that's how it is. You have to deal with it. Um, I, I thought one of the best uh, parts of yesterday and today was when Tiagarwal answered the question about vague replies from VCs. I tell you, it was uh, so refreshingly honest and on. She was absolutely correct, and I can tell you this. I have dealt with hundreds of VCs and VCs, and she was absolutely correct. Don't take this personally because that will happen to you, and you will feel hurt because you would have spent a lot of time. I think one of the important things. You should not become thick skinned, don't get me wrong. You know, being thick skinned is giving in to an inevitability. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you not to take it personally. Taking something not personally is a choice that you make. When you exercise choice, you're in control. Because you're the one exercising the choice. And I think that's important for you to remember. Everything that you do as an entrepreneur, human being generally, but as an entrepreneur, should be an exercising of your choice. Don't ever try, you know, get into a point. Maybe one or two things that might happen, but don't ever, to the extent possible, get into a situation that I had no choice. There is nothing like You always have a choice. Almost 100% of the time. You always have a choice. So, and if you exercise choice, you will gain control, you are empowered. And therefore, as an entrepreneur, there is nothing more important than exercising choice. I wanted to highlight that as a corollary to what Kiki uh, spoke about. And there is a difference, at some point, right now it's too early to talk about this, but at some point in time you'll realize that there is a massive difference between venture capitalists and private equity. I've dealt with both. Uh, they approach life extremely differently, right? Uh, a venture capitalist, you know, I, I say that when the venture capitalist works on the PowerPoint and the private equity works on the Excel, you know, think it very simplistically. Uh, the, as you grow larger, bigger, and you know, start taking money from different kinds of uh, further down, especially CDC and then beyond, PE type investors will start coming in. You will learn by then, you are at a very early stage, it's not stated, that not all, therefore, investors are the same. Kitty spoke about how the decision making by angel uh, investors are quite different uh, to VCs and so on and so forth, and it's quite different. That's the one thing, and I given I run out of time. I'll just have uh, one. Uh, I, I talked about uh, uh, Joel's uh, this thing of uh, trust but verify. The only thing you have to keep in mind, Joel, is that defense business is a business where you deal with the government. When you deal with the government, there is an extremely high probability you won't get your payments on time. Right. Leave aside the other challenges that might be there, I am not standing here taking any moral stance that either that happens. But the real practical problem is that you will not, you will not, most likely you will not get your money in time. So that is something, as you, you are a product guy, you are thinking of the invention, you are thinking of the stuff now. You reach a point when you think of that business as a whole, take some help, people will really understand the business. The nuances and the challenges of the business are something that you should that state you understand. And I talked about um, product market fit. There are a few other pro points that I know, but I will stop there. I think it's been a, I had some lovely conversations with some of you last night, this morning. Um, this afternoon I spent some time with the professor on something very, very interesting. Um, so it's personally for me been a, and continues to be so long as I'm here. Uh, tremendous learning experience. I picked up lots of stuff. Sessions, so we'll go back enriched. and I will be even more enriched if you all have any questions that you ask me and make me A few questions right away, then I'll ask Vijay if you want to then talk after this question on product market fit, maybe of 
product like G and IIT which worked with something else that didn't. Okay, let's first forget yeah, the yeah. I'm just giving you a heads up. I would rather that we have even Q and A more. Okay. Yeah. We can always talk about yeah, whatever it is. If you have the rest of the night, we have the rest of the talk. I'd like to tell you the story. Yeah. Good. So any question of uh, Anand on what he's asking this year? I have a question, uh, especially what you did with uh, sort of the money file group, right? Um, taking them online and, uh, and probably that was done some time back, uh, almost 15 years back. 15 years back. Uh, do you see some of those challenges uh, staying in the market? And because that was probably more of a larger institution doing it, right? It's the same conversation that we had IndiaTimes.com and CP.com who probably got e-commerce in mid-90s, but it was escaped. But then we had someone like Flipkart come in much later, much smaller, and suddenly uh, it was, at least for, from an Indian standpoint, I would say, probably the birth of e-commerce in Ireland. Maybe there was Junkie or some other company. Uh, so is, is, do you see a similar pattern playing out in EdTech? tech? No, I think scale is going to be very different in tech. At peak, and only follow the private side of the number one. Uh, in the country at the time. At peak, we had a little over 460,000 registered students doing graduate and undergraduate programs with us at that time. And that's the last number, by the way. To service them partly using technology, partly uh, hybrid effort in the offline and online work together. Uh, it was very complex. So many interesting things were introduced, including uh, the whole process of conducting every semester examinations and assessing them was, uh, and remember, this is many, many years back, you know. So at that point in time, what Manipal uh, did was to introduce technology based uh, assessments. Uh, so that, in all case of challenges, so that we used to need multiple choice questions, MCQ for the most part, and what happens to critical assessments, so which became a weakness. So we solved it by short format answers which had a very quick assessment capability and so on and so forth. It's a lot of uh, continuous process of it. And remember keeping in mind, and typically a student gave uh, about uh, five or six uh, exams every semester. So even taking a five as a number multiplied by 400,000 uh, is two million <coughs> exams a semester, four million exams a year is a huge number that we have to be handled. Uh, so, so those challenges of scale, have become, the, the scale is much bigger now. Not yet, I don't think anybody has reached that scale yet. I'm not sure about upgrade, whether it's a uh, couple is there, even give me the right number. I don't know the upgrade has reached uh, that number yet, uh, but uh, I doubt it. Uh, not yet. So, but it will get depth and width. Very, very different. Uh, and, but it's, somebody will, you know, for all you know, you know that market is getting opened up again because the regulators had uh, really didn't understand what was happening. So the regulators do what regulators do when they don't understand something, they put a ban. You know, they had banned it for a few years and then now they have opened it up again. Many universities have got the permission to relaunch, so they are all launching in different ways. Uh, you know, you will find uh, universities launching over the next three years a lot of new programs. And some of you must be already dealing with that. The, uh, the accredited so I think that market is going to open up. But there was one fundamental weakness that existed in the market where the output, the graduate of those programs was in no way ready or fit for working in the kind of jobs that were available. You could argue that even a student coming out of a normal engineering college is in no way, most of them anyway, in no way ready. Yet. But to me that's a specious argument because there at least there's an opportunity to do something and change. Here the model does not permit you beyond the point to change. So that's an opportunity. Therefore, I see that as an opportunity, not as a problem, uh, where innovation can come in and therefore you're preparing people and uh, uh, So those are the changes from between then and now. But many of the uh, scale related, uh, language related, you know, language related problems are big problems. So there was English at that time and uh, so we had to do, do a lot of innovation, poor innovation frankly, because we didn't have the technology to support. So that's going to be very different now with the uh, instant translations and many other things that are available. You have translations.
translation caption is almost in like real time, all that is possible now. I think, uh, so that experience of the student and the journey of the student to go through is likely to be far better than what it used to be. I don't know that answers your question. No, it does. Yeah. I, think, I think the biggest takeaway for me from, from what you told us is that the industry is still evolving. So it's evolving. It's 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 sure. it's 20 years yeah. further. Uh, something like e-commerce has gotten to some level of maturity, but it's funny that we are sitting in that industry, it's still evolving. Right, people don't get education. Exactly. Is, is right. Right. Actually, there is a multiple, multiple groups of people who are not allowing education to sit and go ahead. You know, there should be more universities like NIA, the way it is approaching the problem. Why, why ask them? fundamental question. In IT, with all its good intention is still impacting only a maybe a thousand or two hundred people or the students are there. India has much, much bigger than that. I think that's a challenge which our policy makers have in keeping up with the company. Hello. Uh, I have a small question, sir. So I guess uh, I wanted to ask, like uh, you have discussed, you know, when you were discussing right now that you have been an angel investor. So how is your experience exactly? And as you said that you had a good number of portfolio startups as well. So you might have seen some of them have, some of them have even stopped working. So can you just describe more? So what do you feel was the major reason behind that? Like because you are working and you there was your portfolio startups, you had a you know you might be having a more clear idea. And why have they stopped working? So what was the major reasons? Very, very good question. I think I was hoping somebody would ask me something similar to this. Uh, all the entrepreneurs that uh, we have invested made in India, good people, committed, uh, perhaps too much in love with the idea, didn't change. Those were, none was a problem of uh, integrity or anything, you know, anywhere close to that. Because our investment thesis was, uh, the two other part of our investment thesis was, you should like the entrepreneur and you should find core foundational values in the team and uh, then we'll make the investment idea. Of course, that we had that, but the idea was, uh, was second. You know, and then you look at the idea because, you know, you start and strategy changes, ideas change. You have a terminology for that now called pivot. And so you pivot and change and move on. So we were not so worried about uh, the idea itself, we were worried about what they do. Why did they some succeed and why did some fail and why are some still floundering around? I think people who failed fundamentally did not understand something. So we brought up, I something brought up, um, which is this. Uh, understanding scaling in education, the relevance of scaling in education for your product is a part of the product market fit. You have to understand that. You know, in education it's very easy to chop and chop and chop and, you know, reduce everything, you know, and make the denominator pretty small and then put a number on top of it and I'm going to have a 30% market share. Not very difficult. You know, it's very easy to do education. That is a mistake that a lot of people fall into. Well, not because they deliberately want to fool somebody. So, and number one. Number two is many of the problems that they're solving, and I should say that we also didn't realize it. Many of the problems that they were solving, we have not high stakes enough um, that could sustain. You know. um, there were others who were just a matter of uh, uh, not sustaining a, a good delivery and good execution, which is probably the maximum reason. It's all about execution at the end of the day if you are an entrepreneur. It's not about the ideas about how well you execute. It's all about execution. And they did not execute well. And the reason why they did not execute well, most instances, Boiled down to not people that are strong enough to you team. Know, so it's a people game. It's come down to a people game. So that was the. I guess I was and the ones that are successful. Yes. Also have very few people which have made them successful. And remember, because of the pandemic, many of the companies, including the ones that are successful, beginning of the pandemic, their business came to a complete halt. Right. And then uh, there was a gap for half years in some instances. One instance came. Because that was a head tech company which was on, which was predicated on delivering it in the campus. So two and a half years there was zero business. But nobody cancelled, no customer cancelled. Two and a half years brought over campus business on the bank. So the business now is exactly the same as it was when uh, the pandemic struck and next year they're going to do quarter business. 
So, and that happens to be very So, if it comes down to people, sir, like at the end you're saying it's come down to the partner or the people that you're working. So, I should, I, I was actually discussing with the Piyush as well. So, there should be something uh, clear about how to find the people. How to find that partner because that is also a very very major section if you are working as a startup. So how do you figure out? So I guess there should be a session or there should be you know a kind of proper detailing for this or this as well. How do you figure out a right partner? How do you figure out a right co-founder? How do you find a perfect team? How do you see that this is my so this is my? So I think it's a, the answer is is you have to make a choice. The choice is you can maybe be maniacal about the things. Are you maniacal about finding good people? As a, as a, as an entrepreneur or two of you, you know you have to figure out. Each of you can be maniacal. I believe only about three things at a time. If getting good people, you're maniacal about it. And in my journey, I've gone through. Start this very very early by very celebrated VC from the Silicon Valley, and I was maniacal about. I mean, I recruited people who were sitting next to me in a flight. Conversation turned out to be a great fit and have good people. If you have that absolute, I mean, I will not take any prisoners kind of an approach towards making sure you get the right kind of people, you will be okay. Many uh, founders uh, choose to become an angle about raising money so, and valuation. So they meet a lot of people and a significant chunk of their time gets spent on that. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, saying really not important, not at all. But I would say if you spend, let's say, 20% of the time that you have spent on that and take the rating and put it in finding people, you're probably better. And remember one thing, getting this right is very tough. It does not mean it happens perfectly in a large company, in or anybody. I mean, every company goes through a process where they go through a very uh, detailed and honest process and maniacal about it in terms of getting people. So it doesn't work out. So don't uh, kill yourself, it doesn't work out. But you got to be fast about it uh, when you when such thing happens in terms of decision. Graceful about it and uh, uh, letting go, letting yourself go both ways. And uh, making sure that you get the right idea. So people, at the end of the day, it's all about people. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have five minutes, five hundred questions. Five minutes. So we'll start. And then as I said, form your questions. Some that you would have caught off, some that you, some that happened accidentally. But anyway, let me just try to give it a shot. So, uh, GNIT actually came out of most of the actors who were involved in GNIT are present in this room. First, including Balaji, who was there at that time. He was a beneficiary, by the way. But the, it, it came out of a thought. Uh, when we were looking at NIIT, the original value proposition of NIIT was if you have a college degree and no job, NIIT will change your life. That was the original value. <coughs> That's not exactly what the ad left, but uh, right, but let me just say, correct? Which means it was to make unemployed graduates who were not engineers. 
uh, those they are getting into engineering itself for the uh, major achievement in life. Right? Therefore, there were very few engineering courses. And the thought came from the fact that if you were an ordinary graduate and if you had to be successful in life as a uh, IT professional, programmer, a software programmer, uh, in very simple words, but let's call it IT professional, then you needed more than a short course. And just when you finished graduation, you were in a hurry to get on to a job. And the fact that during graduation, it was all party time, because there was one exam at the end of three years, or sometimes there were exam every year. So this was one scenario. The other scenario was that we wanted to have a more structured approach to a student's learning in a manner that the student has everything that the student needs, therefore making himself a compelling case to hire. Instead of a three-month course, four-month course, where after that the employer had to invest a lot. Okay. So this is the time when Dr. Professor Sia Mitra and Professor Manche came from Bitspilani and came to NIIT and at that time there was an institutionalization of NIIT's basic structure where we said how do we, that, that, uh, that uh, activity was called the higher education way, uh, HEW, whose purpose was how do we institutionalize NIIT that it becomes a structured learning program which somebody can bank on and the employer can bank on and feel comfortable that this would fulfill the requirements of their hiring a well-trained professional, these two had to be met. So if that had to be done after graduation, there was no time because people were in a hurry for a job. If it had to be done before graduation, then how do we marry it with the graduation? So I, I think there were a number of brilliant prospects and architecture which went into that. So the program was just as soon as you get into college, instead of getting involved in three years of party time and then a frenzy to go and get yourself a job, what if you start your learning process at that time? So we created the concept of a dual qualification means over the uh, college uh, uh, period when you didn't, anyway you didn't go to college, you actually went and uh, you know you were more, uh, spending more time in the canteen or doing whatever else, we actually used your time to study and therefore organize it and, and, uh, and synchronize it with your college learning process so that when you have exams, this course slows down. When you have when you have to prepare for exam, this course gives you the leeway to be able to prepare for the exam. You take breaks and therefore you join in the first year. Typically first year. Most of the people will join towards end of first year or second year. And you completed four semesters. Four semesters of this program. It was organized as a as a full fledged very, very structured program and I mentioned yesterday that if you have to deliver something uh, in a predictable outcome manner, then it has to be a very strongly processized. So that whole process was created and uh, uh, and in that each semester you learned something, applied something, you know, that uh, the base pedagogy was, uh, was obviously always learn, apply, learn, apply, learn, apply, you know, and move on. <coughs> As soon as you completed graduation, now you were ready to go for what was known as professional practice. So there the partnerships with uh, industry came in. And industry first, based on the past experience they had with NIIT, had a fundamental belief that if NIIT is doing something, it must be good. So they came forward and they gave an opportunity to these guys who had done four semesters to come and finish their professional practice, which was actually a for credit, for credit in NIT, no, no university credits then. Uh, 
in an IT that uh, somebody would be evaluating you, the, uh, the employer will also be evaluating you. At the end of which, you are now ready to be hired as a professional. 90% of the students got hired by the organization where they went through professional practice. So they would get a small stipend which paid for all that they had paid over the period of time by and large and the, uh, the, the employer got the ready-made person whom he had tried out for a period of money. That was the construct. And the contract was also that you have three years but you have only four semesters of these. So you can take breaks, one summer you want to go for a holiday, don't worry. So you had plenty of time. So it was well organized that it fitted well in the life of the individual. And then of course through word of mouth and the rigor that got applied, in fact it became a part of uh, uh, a part of a social conversation. So what is your son doing now? He is doing physics honors or whatever. BCom at Sri Ram and NIIT. Sorry, or GNIT. BCom at Sri, Sri Ram and GNIT. Christ College in, and GNIT. Or whatever, Presidency College and GNIT. Or Elphinstone College and GNIT. Depending on the city you were in, right? So that became part of the social conversation. And I think at one point of time we had nearly 90,000 students who were doing their professional practice <coughs> at its peak. And obviously all of them finally got employed. So that, that was a very, very successful program. And we realized that we had become a part of the social fabric. When the matrimonial acts, <laughs> said 26 years old, fair, young man looking for a bride, right? Yeah, or 27, 25 year old, a beautiful ABC girl looking for a match when we start, or a graduate, or an engineer, right? It used to say that earlier. When we started saying a 25 year old engineer, GNIIT looking for a match. <laughs> Typically, GNIIT never had to look for a match. It was the other <laughs> The short version is that it's very good product market fit. <laughs> So, so that, that the prayers were the prayers were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that leads me to the next question. You said something about word of mouth. So now we see most of us here that, that are into upskilling. Uh, a huge chunk of the model for us is very much sales driven, right? So was this the case for you guys as well? Was it always that you probably had some form of counselor on uh, in the physical center that actually? pushing a sale or did you guys have uh, call centers I don't think were probably that much of a thing back then but probably physical guys doing sales uh, or was it usually people are just walking in and they, they really want to do an IIT they already made up their mind. Okay, so uh, we've been through both, we've been through both. Uh, I'll give you the one where uh, I felt very proud when the process time. My car got spoiled. I got a call one day in, uh, in Mumbai saying, IT officer is a admission. Right? And I said, uh, How do you Sorry. How do you You changed the picture. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> like, don't <laughs> shift it. <laughs> there were a idea of it also, but this particular one is not a <laughs> so, uh, so, I told him, look, I test for that, or 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 test for that, he didn't get past the We were very strict about our interest test. Okay. Uh, it's a separate issue that over a period of time that we felt then we are not doing enough to actually reaching those who actually need us more. 
So we created some programs for them also, so that they could come up, and many of them did come up. Okay, and there are one or two chances which we took. In fact, the guy who wrote Windows 10, part of the Windows 10 team, was one of those who failed our entrance. <laughs> did a supplementary program, uh, a makeup program, so that he could get ready for it, and then finished the main program, and then went to Microsoft and did whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> so this guy failed. So obviously he didn't. He was not taken in. Then I got a call. Okay, call was it? Phone up. I said, "I to this guy not like that." He said, "Ah, which big university? Oh, that to big, big vice chancellor be karte hain." Principal, what big vice principal did they have? Who admission? I said, "Ah, Pana Karwali did." He said, "No, no." He was not. So I didn't give. Then he said, "Oh, niche to a car ki gadi thi ye, wo brown color thi, one seven three three." कहाँ <laughs> 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 But I think those are also instances which created further respect for an enemy. So, our decision is about talk about that. So, I think those are some issues. Uh, artificial, there were plenty in life. Yeah, I think that's the end. Yeah, maybe it's not a problem. I'll add a little bit to that. Uh, luck plays a bigger role than we have used. Timing plays a bigger role, but timing you can choose, meaning that uh, many things are happening. I think Anna talked about understand the world and how it's changing. So making some use of where things are unlikely to happen, making some judgment calls of where things like what is likely to happen, is a very important thing to do for you. There are things like you can So a combination of these, and luck is important. When we say Indian IT industry is kind of wonder, look at the accident that happened. Started with uh, Rajiv Gandhi comes PM, not part of that. Dando thing gets hold of people like Sal Petrola, not part of plan. And then that's when the couple of people cowboy story side that you guys don't know anything, just getting people to do a business. One. 1981. Uh, 1990. Economic crisis. You know, choice. So the government tells the industry all of you guys, every sector, what do you want us to do to help you export and get foreign exchange to buy oil? So that becomes a huge incentive. Sam Petrol, of course, came and bought on the telecom thing, right? So, 1991 was the second unplanned, unanticipated accident which contributed. Then the internet arrived, we get in there, I think, through the internet arrived. Then the Y2K coding, which had been done by people, didn't recognize that year 2000 thing to blow up, not our creation. Even if you just take these four forces, they did more to drive the IT industry than all of us collectively. However, coming back to understand the world and how it's changing, a lot of people started looking at these as opportunities. And uh, so, I think we were, we were more excited originally by the fact that there will be a talent shortage. Which I talked about the next So our theme was about talent is going to be short, people make computers. And the talent story has run through. And then why took a half of that team but then it was in a bit of a trouble because the classic story of Mr. Narayan Muthi told me once he lived, he grew up in Bangalore, in uh, Mysore. So once after he had become the you know, one, and then it was very big. He said I was driving in Mysore and they had to Campus and he said, I went past the little government house where he was. So he was very nostalgic, he went inside the house. 
did that. And not and uh, so young girl got it that girl opened the door. So he says uh, 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 we have lived here, so can I just see the house? So they called him and she and her two sisters uh, were delighted that he had come and so on and so forth. They knew about him for this of course and they knew about IT. So he said, so what are you guys planning to do? So the elder one says, I was thinking of IT but now it's all over. <laughs> she tells the right to come and do what you come. Now it's all over so I'll have to do something else. So, so, so there was that period. But suddenly people who were saying, IT ho gaya, the ho gaya. what to do? So then we saw a huge drop in demand at that time because that time one is of course everybody wants everybody didn't want to do an IT career, but people started recognizing that IT will help you. It's helping everybody. That you used to have a guy who said if you're not having it an IT, you're missing something. Kind of what something? Something. People say that there's something to relate to it. Then we actually looked at the banking sector. In fact, we didn't go. They talked about the, person, the loan we got. The person from ICICI who was sharing a cabin with the other person was uh, Mr. Kamal. And Kamal was one of his early loans. And he is the one who said there is a refinancing scheme right there, but you'll have to convince them. Anyway, second loan was ICICI. He, he wrote the loan. And 2005, 2006, when the banking industry was about to explode, he called us. And he said, look, what you guys did for IT industry, you know, and, so and we formed a joint, joint, joint venture. We called it the for final bank. And that gave us a huge demand as a second thing. In between, we started new things and shut them up. We started a company called National Institute of Sales. Because we said professional selling is going to happen. But salesmen have to get a sales number that was not acceptable. So we said we have to professionalize it. And we started running a very good program with a lot of science, a lot of technology, everything behind it. And at that time, Reliance was into telecom. That was like NIT. They were getting into They were, uh, they, they had all these petrol pumps. Uh, NIT. No. In the 1989, Yeah. So between the, yeah, the energy and the telecom, Mukesh Ambani was going very big. And NIS had them as the main customer, 60 percent. And we had some youngster had joined us to set it up, and he had a whole thing small with him. So he came up and said, "Look, I'm getting a request from Relias that is NIS willing to sell." He so said, "Don't be foolish, I have been that for years." And then he talked about it. We were that this is pre dot uh, com bus, so we were too busy in IT. So he said, "Okay." not getting your engineering deserved, it's fascinating. And we exited that. So, no regrets about that. It's a different story that then Makesh Mani sold telecom to his brother who mucked it up. So the team left from there and joined Airtel. What are the company called? Sent down. Anyway, went through. So there have been exits and points in time. Uh, some time well, some time not so well in but the idea was that we had to keep looking for things which look interesting on the horizon. And even the GNIT professor C. R. Vindra, who just retired at Chris Pilani, we had a few people from Chris Pilani who used to hire from everywhere. But we had also hired laterally some people who were in Chris Pilani. So that continues to be, to be the role model for reforming higher education in this last century. It was the example. So when he retired, he come to, to for something he was traveling abroad or whatever. And then we, you had been with us uh, a little before that, or half an hour, eighty-eight, And he, so he came in eighty-nine. Eighty-nine. Then, so he actually, uh, we told him, you know, he was to go to the U.S. We had to discuss something. So he said, but I'm going after three months, and so we told him, can we advise him because we had this. Thing of running a one month program, thing, six month program, or we have a, we had a 12 month program, I think, no? Just we had a 12 month program, so we said this, but very, very low. Linearly, linearly, if it goes wrong, it will become three years, then we'll be in conflict with the formal system and we don't want to do that. 
to help us. So then, that was also an idea that we seized immediately to say, okay, this is the future problem for us. We are informal, you don't want to be the formal sector. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting way the product market fit was done in that case. You remember we went down those days with all of First hundred we signed up. The, the first hundred GNITs we signed. Yeah, yeah. So, the a lot had product got configured as we went along. Where do they, when do they have time in different cities? So, we went and spoke to uh, the employees and to buy into the idea. So, there the central thing was uh, multiple win win. What's in it for the student? What's in it for the employer? What's in it for the so, very often when you get your chances to have multiple players, the normal thing we are taught is when you use. If you get something more, I get something less. In, in life, our, our experience is if you build partnerships, then you're willing to give 51 and 50 for It works to your advantage. So, the multiple win win was the student would have had one year of experience by the time they finished the right? So difficult to get. But more than that, we worked with early employers to fix a minimum stipend and the figure was that in 12 months they would earn back the full fee they had paid us. So for a student's parent, the proposition was that funded. This even during we by the by the time the course get over the student is part. So that was a big problem. And for the employees, I think which have made a point that that time people were very worried about hiring people to hire you. So you come in as a trainee, run back, and don't take you at most. And I pay you less than you do a much better job. And for so, NIT, the story was you know, what do you offer you? We're offering you more. That's what all of us are struggling with. You want company guarantee, how many ISAs, everything is about making the story in the future. So the multiple win win model uh, was again an idea. We launched an IT and an IT for the ISCA. We keep thinking about the IT, we keep thinking about the IT, we keep thinking about the IT, we keep thinking about the IT. Also, we keep thinking about the IT, we keep thinking about the IT. What's the view that you have? It's my IT and IT. So with that, I think we're ready.